Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Maludumim in Israel. We tend to believe that the way things are today is the way things always have been. Although we intuitively know that this is obviously false, we still have a hard time coming to grips with the idea that things were radically different throughout the past. As recent as 20 years ago, very few people had anything that could be called a computer let alone a smartphone. As recent as 70 years ago, nobody had a television. If we went back a little over a century ago, hardly anybody had electricity in their homes. A couple of decades further back, and only the wealthy had running water in their house. Today, these are necessities that very few people would consider living without. But there is photographic evidence of virtually everyone surviving just fine without them. The further we go back, the changes get even more drastic. What we could call modern medicine did not exist two centuries ago. Hardly anybody in the world had the right to vote. Most people, even in the most advanced societies, couldn't write and could barely read. The overwhelming majority lived a subsistence subsistence lifestyle, adjusting to the seasons and hoping to survive the next catastrophe. Death was an ever-present specter, always looming in the distance and frequently right outside the door. The differences were not only technological or health-related. Society was a completely different animal in the not-so-distant and distant past. The right of kings was universal, as was the dominance of religious authority. One owed their allegiance to whomever demanded it, and rebellion could very easily mean a cruel death. Beliefs in all manner of superstition was the rule and not the exception. There was no scientific explanation for anything, so everything was subject to the whim of whichever deity was in charge. The man ruled the home, the Lord ruled the man, and everyone feared whomever whomever was above them. Women were essentially slaves, though they probably were unaware of it since this was just the norm. Children were the future, whose future hung on a precarious perch of disease, war, or powerlessness. If we go back to biblical times, we would find that all this was just as real as the internet is for us. We would also find that society was structured along tribal lines. What we consider to be an archaic vestige of primitive times was the gold standard of the biblical past. One's tribe was one's identity, much more so than one's title or one's appearance. Tribes were the biblical versions of nations, but with much more attachment to bloodlines and lineage. With a few exceptions that get noted in the Bible, the individual was almost invariably subsumed under the tribe. This week's Parsha is called Bamidbar. That word means in the wilderness or in the desert. It is the first significant word in the fourth book of the Bible, which also goes by this name in Hebrew, though it is more commonly known as Numbers. That name is based on the Latin Bible and comes from the fact that not one but two senses of the Israelites are taken in the course of this book. It is a book that really takes place in the wilderness, the stark and vast biblical desert that stretches from the Sinai Peninsula to the eastern spine of Canaan. There are droughts and rebellions and wars and great prophetic orations in this book, but there is also the establishment of the great tribal system of the ancient Israelites. Much of this takes place in the first Parsha of this epic book. The first census takes up a good deal of the Parsha with with its 12 tribes of tens of thousands of male adults. The numbers are so vast that they can constitute one of the great questions of biblical veracity. How did these hundreds of thousands or even millions of people just wander around the desert for 40, 40 years without leaving so much as a trace? Occasionally, archaeologists will claim to have found some evidence of this huge migration, but nothing conclusive has ever been turned up. The numbers are way too big for known populations of 3,000 odd years ago, so they have to either be taken as a matter of faith or rejected as biblical exaggeration. Nevertheless, each tribe is numbered and the total male adult population of slightly over 600,000 is also stated clearly. Right after this, the tribe of Levi, a kind of 13th tribe, is counted according to males of one month and older. Why this discrepancy is there is left unclear, but also leaves us with another puzzle, as this tribe is markedly smaller than all the others. With the extra young males being counted, one might have expected the reverse. On top of all that is the question of why 
Levi was not one of the main 12 tribes. Levi was the third son of Jacob, and among his descendants were none other than Moshe and Aaron. The two sons of Joseph are both counted as among the 12 tribes, and for some reason Levi was selected as the tribe left out of the 12 tribes scheme. There is a long section dealing with the tribal arrangements during the journeys through the wilderness. This was clearly not a haphazard process, it's each, as each tribe has its place and its order in the marches. There are four tribes which are deemed as leaders of two others, making four groups of three tribes each, one in each of the cardinal directions surrounding the Ark of the Covenant. Encampments, encampments were all done strictly according to this arrangement. It gave order and structure to the Israelite society as a whole. In this tribal arrangement, the Levite's place was in the inner encampment surrounding the ark. They were chosen as the guardians of the ark and in the entire facility of the tabernacle. Again, why they were given this status is at first left unclear. It seems to have been the way things were meant to be. The last third of the Parsha goes into the census of the Levite subfamilies. There are three of these families, and they are, all, they are of approximately equal numbers. Specific tasks are, tasks are given to each of these families in the overall functioning of the tabernacle. At the pinnacle of the whole arrangement was Aaron and his sons, who were the Kohanim, or priests, who officiated at the actual ceremonies. Moshe was in charge of everything, even though his actual tribal status was that of a Levite and not a Kohen. We do get some clarity as to why the Levites were selected for their specific tasks and roles. In a somewhat curious few verses in the middle of the Parsha, we are told that they were substitutes for the firstborn, who apparently really should have had this role. Quote, God spoke to Moshe, saying, I have taken the Levites from among the Israelites in place of the firstborn who opened the womb of the Israelites, and the Levites shall be mine. For to me were the firstborn on the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. I sanctified to me all the firstborn of Israel, from people to animals. They shall be mine. I am Hashem. This seems to be setting up some sort of exchange between the Levites and the firstborn, who really belong to God. Indeed, later on in the Parsha, there's a process of the Levites formally replacing the firstborn. When the counts are given for the firstborn, it turns out that there are exactly 273 more firstborn than there are Levite males of more than a month old. Those 273 had to be redeemed by the payment of a certain amount of silver. This process has remained today in the ceremony known as the redemption of the firstborn. Silver money is given to a Kohen to release the first, that firstborn male from whatever bonds would otherwise be upon him. Jewish tradition has it that the underlying rationale behind this exchange was that the service of the tabernacle should have been the responsibility of the firstborn. Each family was to give their firstborn son to God, perhaps in payment for those firstborn surviving the final plague of the Exodus. Jewish tradition goes further and says that the firstborn lost this privilege or responsibility during the events surrounding the incidents of the golden calf. In that catastrophe, everybody participated, including the firstborn, with the exception of the Levites. In reward for this dedication, they were granted the privilege of the responsibilities of re maintaining the tabernacle. Such are the fortunes of those who devote themselves to religion and those who don't. Assuming we accept this addition from Jewish tradition, a very interesting thing emerges. One's status in the religious and tribal hierarchies was not necessarily fixed simply by birth and bloodline. Although that was an essential requirement in biblical society, it wasn't absolute. The Levites were really no different from any other tribe in terms of status. It was only due to their devotion shown during the Golden Calf Incident that their status was elevated. Conversely, the firstborn had a unique position in society owing to, owing to their birth status as firstborn. This, according to tradition, resulted in that status being conferred to, in some religious function. But when they shirked their roles with the golden calf, that's, their status was reduced to a shadow of its former position. They were effectively fired and the Levites hired in their place. Tribal affiliation was a strong and powerful voice in biblical society. 
but it wasn't necessarily of absolute permanence. In this case, it was overruled and another rule was substituted in its place. This may have been a unique case in biblical Israelite history, but there may have been other cases. The prophets seem to have come from situations that had nothing to do with tribe or family status. It was a role that was based strictly on merit. Even a convert could be a prophet. This meshing of individual merit and tribal status has remained in some form in Judaism until today. It is strange to modern people, but it is one of the things that makes Judaism unique and seem both antiquated and genuine. The tribe was everything, but so were individual deeds. We live in a world in which most of this seems quite foreign and even bizarre. We prefer to believe that our society is based entirely on merit and no regard whatsoever is given to ridiculous notions such as lineage or societal status. But even as we tell ourselves this, we are constantly reminded that this is simply not the case. All kinds of privilege based on family, name, race, or political association is rampant everywhere. It is almost impossible for any society to escape these things, no matter how hard it tries or believes. There have been vast changes in society since biblical times, but some things, despite all our efforts, remain the same. Shabbat Shalom.